Well, happy Friday, everyone. I'm Nick Slavic. I'm proprietor of the Nick Slavic Painting and Restoration Company. I'm also the host of this show, Ask a Painter Live. It's a weekly live Facebook show. Uh, I come to you usually midday Friday. Uh, I use my 22, 23 years of experience as a painter, craftsman, uh, restorationist, decorator, wallpaper hanger, and uh, furniture restorationist to answer any of your questions that you have live here. Uh, on the air. So uh, <clears throat> if you're just joining us here, uh, questions type down here, uh, anything you would like, uh, and I will get to those questions at the end here. I have a, a bunch of questions that people sent in today, and I'm actually here at a job site on the last day of a kitchen uh, enamel. Uh, my boys and I have been installing cabinets, a uh, little bit of paint on the walls, a little bit of paint on the ceiling, and uh, we're pushing this one forward. This is actually a really cool one. Uh, Navajo white uh, on the cabinets and uh, Revere pewter on the walls, which is a combination I've wanted to use for a long time. And luckily enough, uh, the homeowner let me kind of pick the color. So uh, Mary, if you're at work tuning into this, here's your kitchen. Uh, <laughs> it'll, be, uh, it'll be really nice when you get home. Uh, it, it'll be quite different than, uh, than when you left this morning. So here's a little sneak peek at, uh, at your kitchen. So uh, I'm going to go over a couple um, uh, questions that uh, some pros and some homeowners had sent in today. Uh, if there's anything you guys would like to know, if you've always had these burning questions that you've always wanted to ask a professional painter, uh, certainly just uh, type them here and I can take care of those for you. Um, let's see, wondering if there's anything else I'm missing on this one here. I don't think so. Um, ask a Painter does have a new home on Facebook. If you're watching this, you have found it. Uh, I used to broadcast this through my uh, personal page. Uh, I wanted to separate it for professional reasons uh, and, and so that I can find all of your questions when they come in. If you guys have questions during the week for me, uh, start a separate post or a separate thread for each one of those. Don't reply to something else that get buried in there. I want to be able to reference these and send people to them so that we can see them too. So, um, number one, uh, let's see, Rob. Rob Grant, friend of mine from Canada, a pro painter. Uh, he wrote in a question here, how do you deal with contractor customer uh, that is making no efforts to pay when the job is complete? Uh, I've always had a motto, pay me when the job is done. Unfortunately, some people or businesses don't take payment seriously. So now I make it a point to talk about payment when doing a quote. And uh, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, through the PDCA, the Painting and Decorating Contractors of America, I'm on a list of people that uh, contractors can call if they have business questions. Uh, things like that and a lot of the questions I get are uh, about estimating and then about you know just payment in a timely method and really you know the only way to guarantee payment uh, is to basically gain the trust of your homeowner um, that's why uh, people always like to try to get around this estimating process I love to be face to face I love to be in the people's homes uh, instantly if you're a uh, if you're a student of human nature you can instantly tell if this person is, is interested in this, uh, is possibly interested down the road, is a serious customer or not. I treat them all the same. It, it doesn't matter to me. Um, everybody gets a free estimate, but you can tell if, uh, if there's a lot of price haggling, if somebody wants something very cheap, very quick, and then they want to maybe make payments or they want to do this and that, you can tell it's, it's maybe not something you want to get into. Now, the problem is if you don't have a lot of work on the books, jobs like that are still tempting, but you have to tell yourself, I have this uh, uh, standard uh, that I have to adhere to. And even if you would really like that job, you just have to say it's not worth it and, and walk away from stuff like that. As a uh, business owner and an entrepreneur and as the sole <laughs> provider of uh, you know heat and food and water for my family, <clears throat> in the early years, it's very difficult to pass up stuff like that. So sadly, there is not a magical phrase. There's not a magical contract. Um, as a matter of fact, I don't even have contracts. Uh, Ten years uh, of business on my own, I've never had anybody give me any money down, and uh, I've never had a contract. I've also never not been paid. So there's this whole thing of, you know, this unwritten rule of trust where I can, I can uh, sniff somebody out pretty quickly if they're not interested. And most of the time, they're just not interested and they won't ask you to take the job. But, you know, I think uh, my personality, my business attracts a certain type of people. Um, and I think that a lot of people uh, are very kind and don't waste my time with, uh, you know, just kind of price shopping estimates and things like this. And even though I'm always happy to, to go out there. But, Rob, I wish there was some piece of software. I wish there was some special magic phrase you could tell the homeowner to guarantee payment but honestly it has 100 percent to do with 
uh, how you present yourself at the estimate, which I'm sure you do uh, very well, and then 100% to do uh, a combination of that and their personality. Um, you know, you can do the best job, you can be the most trustworthy, you can lay out all these certain things, and even if you have a contract, some people uh, may not feel like paying you or may take a long time to pay. And, you know, the longer I'm in business, uh, I, I, I'm, you know, you, you sort of find patterns in things. Homeowners associations, churches, the larger the business, the longer they take time to pay. Uh, the more people are involved and the bigger the organization, the longer it is that they're going to take to pay. I have a very good client in New Prague um, who gives me uh, a couple jobs a year. Uh, I keep their office uh, facility up. Um, I know that it's going to be between 60 and 90 days uh, to get money out of those people. It's a huge organization, worldwide stretch. Uh, and come about 60 days, I make my call into the company and I say, hey, you know, you still have this from, you know, 60 days out. And they'll say, can you please sub resubmit the invoices? And then a week or two later, I get my payment. Happens every time. Not a big deal. Hey, you just have to expect it. If you don't want the work, if you don't want to deal with that, you know, that's fine. But it's just one of those things where I've just come to accept that, you know, it is what it is. So. Oh, Rob, glad to see you popped up there, buddy. I actually just finished in your question, so you may have to rewind this a little bit and get to it. But uh, let me know, uh, you know, if you, if you watch this now or later today, let me know if I answered your question right, Rob. And thank you for watching. Uh, Danielle Peterson uh, from Wisconsin, uh, she asked, how do you clean paint off carpet when people, like me, didn't put down drop cloths or it splatters? Uh, you know, like somebody spills an entire can of paint and it seeps through the sheet that was down, uh, dot, 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 dot. So, um, <laughs> this is a tough one. Um, the, the best advice I can give you is number one, don't ever use a bed sheet. Uh, it doesn't even stop drips. The reason that painters use, you know, super thick canvas uh, and not plastic is that the drips absorb into the canvas but they don't go all the way through so that even when you walk on a drip you don't track it across the carpet if you use plastic and you get some little drips on there you're just gonna step in it and it's gonna stay wet and walk across so I know it's a pain but for 10 bucks you can buy one of the nicest super heavy drop cloths you'll ever use and it'll be with you the rest of your life you can use it for all sorts of other things that's the best thing, uh, best advice I can give you. If you don't do that, lay down plastic and then the bed sheet. At least you'll have a little bit of absorption, uh, but then the plastic will sort of be the fail safe. Now, if all this goes to pot and you have paint on your carpet, the first thing I can tell you is keep it wet. The second it happens, uh, whenever there's a little bit of a, uh, you know, if somebody drops a uh, brush on a drop cloth inside a house, or if there's a little bit of a paint that's more than a drip on a drop cloth, I immediately say wrap that sucker up watch your feet and just get it out of the house. Lay it outside, we'll take it back to the shop, we'll let it dry out. If we're, if we're outside, not a big deal, you drag it into the sun on the grass. But if you do get paint on your floors, immediately just keep it wet, get it wet, even though you, if, it, uh, if it seems like you're uh, you know, counter, uh, counterintuitive there, um, keep it wet and start brushing. Uh, use a series of rags, use a series of uh, sponges, something to start soaking it out of there, but keep it wet the whole time. The second that stuff dries, now you have to do uh, other mechanical methods there. And uh, Rick, I see you chiming in there, a uh, steam back. That would be awesome <laughs> if everybody had a steam back at the ready. Uh, and certainly get one, but have somebody keep that sucker wet while somebody goes gets a commercial carpet cleaner, you know, like a, uh, uh, I forget what they're called, uh, you know, a dirt devil or something like that from the hardware store, from uh, Home Depot or something like that. That would be the best thing you could do, but you have to keep it wet the whole time there. Uh, that's with water-based paint. Oil-based paint, good luck. You can use some solvents, but you have to be very careful with solvents on carpet. Um, one thing that I do, uh, I had a homeowner ask me to remove a tiny bit of paint. It wasn't a big, thick drip that you would have to cut out of the carpet. It was more like somebody just you know, took a brush or a roller and sort of grazed the carpet. I, I was asked to remove it, and what I did first, you always, uh, Oh, the way of thinking about this is go from easiest method uh, and, and the least abrasive, uh, the least harmful, all the way up to something caustic or, or more abrasive. So immediately, you know, I will take a rag and some water. I wet the area, pat it down, and just scrub. A lot of times, if you, if you scrub one way and then another and then another, you can actually loosen that paint up a little bit. You're never going to reactivate dried water-based paint, but you can at least soften it a little bit and then sort of get it out. If the rag or the towel doesn't do it, then you go to a stiff bristled brush. 
uh, a nylon bristle brush. If you use a metal, a brass, a stainless steel brush, something like that, uh, you will actually start pulling up carpet. Uh, it's a way of defuzzing your carpet, but if you don't want to defuzz your carpet, that's sort of uh, how it goes there. So number one, uh, work your way through that. If water and abrasive, uh, a, a stiff bristle brush does not work, then you want to start tiptoeing into chemicals. Uh, the first thing I would do is goo gone or goof off. Um, there, that is the sort of trade name for the homeowner product version of that. I always carry a little can because it's small, it's convenient. There's lots of things, xylol, rubbing alcohol, this and that. You can go get the, the base chemicals, the starter chemicals that make a lot of that stuff from your home centers, your hardware stores, but then you're left with a quart or a, or a pint or something like that. You can just go get a couple of dollar can of Goo Gone and that'll take care of lots and lots of stuff. So I would try that and then slowly, slowly, but if you are able to go in the closet or a corner of a closet and try out a little area there first to make sure uh, it's color fast, things like that, definitely try that first before you go into the middle of a bedroom or a living room or something like that. So that's the best advice I can give you for that. Um, if, uh, if water-based paint does not come out after those things with a stiff bristle brush, you know, you're, uh, you're going to have to do a series of cleanings. If it's very thick, sort of shaggy kind of carpet, sometimes you can get a razor knife or scissors and clip the ends off that have it, but you're going to alter the appearance there. So um, if you found a solution uh, to this, Danielle, let me know. Uh, if, if, if you solved this yourself using one of those methods or something else, let me know. I'm always curious about what, what comes. Um, I've seen some pretty magical things over the years. Uh, there was uh, a carpet sample that uh, somebody was claiming was, you know, spill proof and this and that. And I was always curious about this sort of thing. And it was just a small sample and it's treated with some sort of you know, Teflon treatment. It's not Scotch-Brite. It was some other thing. It's probably very close to Scotch-Brite though. Uh, but I, I had asked the person, you know, well, will it stand up to this? So I, I took a drop of paint out of my work truck. I, I had the work truck with me. You drop it in the center there and I just took a wet rag and wiped it. And this very dark carpet came perfectly clean. So whatever they treated it with uh, worked very well. Now, with any of these sort of treatments uh, and things like that, I'm sure it wears off after a while, but that was pretty cool. So I have seen ways to treat your carpet for that, but if you have enough foresight to treat your carpet with things like this, uh, you're probably not the same person as the one who, who drops paint on it, or you know at least intentionally. So I hope that helps out. Uh, let's see what we got here. Jim Callahan, a frequent frequent viewer and, uh, and charter member of the Mug Club. Oh, and uh, by the way, Danielle, uh, you have not received a mug yet for your question. I will send that out to you, uh, and then you will be part of the hashtag Mug Club. So, uh, Jim, uh, Jim uh, does furniture restoration as well. He's very good at it. I've been following a lot of his projects there. Uh, MDF primed beadboard. What product would you paint it with and how would you apply the paint? I actually have some of this in my uh, bathroom upstairs in my house. Um, I really love the tongue and groove stuff. That's real wood that's milled about two, two beads and two boards to a set and you put it up and do that. Um, the stuff I was finding was too thick. I needed something very thin because I couldn't, uh, I had to work within the parameters of, uh, of my uh, trim in my bathroom. So um, what I did was I used the MDF uh, bead board and I actually used, uh, at the time, this was six, seven, eight years ago, a uh, water-based uh, Benjamin Moore Imperval, which was a very, very good paint to use. Now at the time, uh, I was applying it by hand in my house just because it's a small bathroom and I didn't want to uh, break out the sprayers and prep the whole house for it. Uh, I used a little bit of Floetrol in it to, to extend the open time so that when I had a beautiful uh, nylon bristled brush, um, uh, a very soft bristled brush, it would give me that open time to, I, I did my whole ceiling and then I did a wainscot. So I wanted that open time to be able to do finish strokes all the way across the ceiling and get it nice and smooth. So I think I end up using, you know, the maximum Floetrol per gallon of paint is about eight ounces. I think I use maybe four to six. If, if you go too much, especially with white enamel or off-white enamel, uh, it doesn't cover as well. So you have to be real careful with that because you're actually just diluting the paint a little bit with, with the actual Floetrol. So you have to be careful about uh, coverage and things like that. Um, I did an experiment in that bathroom as well. Uh, everybody, uh, I see a lot of painters, even on this old house, this puzzles me. They're painting the outside of a historic home, tiny little clabbers with a roller, and then they come back and do a brush to get the lips. And to me, I have never figured out how guys economically thinking can use a weenie roller and a brush and still get a good finish in a quick time, B 
be efficient, keep a wet edge, things like that um, outside. Inside, I actually tried the weenie roller to see if I could get the, you know, those are just tiny little rollers about the size of a hot dog on a smaller frame. I did an experiment to see if I could get all the paint on quickly and then finish it off with a brush to get a nice uh, clean brush strokes. And what I found is that um, it was okay, but it still wasn't as good as me just brushing. Because you found that you sort of extended yourself maybe a little too far or just far enough where the edges of where you are painting uh, would start to dry out a little bit, even though the middle was completely wet and stuff like that. So I just like the control, especially when you have beadboard and you have small little segments. You can go top to bottom a couple boards at a time and finish it off. I found that uh, even the weenie rollers uh, didn't get in the grooves of that uh, uh, MDF beadboard. Even uh, when you use a little bit thicker uh, weenie roller, like a half inch nap, you had to really press that stuff to get in there. So. You know, again, I, I will keep using a brush for stuff like that. Uh, also, nowadays, I would spray. Uh, Jim, I used Water Base and Pergo because that was my go-to cabinet and trim finish at the time. Since that time, Benjamin Moore came out with Advance, uh, which is a hybrid oil and water-based enamel. Uh, for many reasons, it's a, it's a better product. Uh, it's actually a little bit thinner, a little easier to work with, has a longer open time, and uh, the benefit is you don't get that smell like a traditional oil. But uh, from my experience with historic homes and things like that, what you're left with after that water evaporates is as close to a traditional oil finish as I found, besides using you know, the Imperva oil uh, like that. It's a beautiful, beautiful finish. It sands wonderful after about a day. Uh, and it, to me, especially in my historic home, I want the look of uh, the old oil as well. It, it is a different look. You have to sort of be a connoisseur of, of fine finishes, but if I see two doors side by side, one painted with uh, water-based Imperval and one painted with you know advanced uh, hybrid or, uh, or true oil, to me, there's all the difference in the world. <laughs> you know, not only in hardness of the finish, uh, durability of the finish, but the look, the look and the feel is huge to me. And the advanced sort of is, uh, is one of those new technologies where uh, I'm on board with. I'm usually not on board with, hey, we got this wood varnish, but it's water-based. That's a disaster. Nobody's come up with anything even close uh, to what I can do with true oil varnish. But for whatever reason, uh, and, and Sherwin-Williams has their product as well, the Pro Classic Hybrid, uh, they have it dialed in. The, uh, the Pro Classic is a little thicker, it dries quicker, and it's got a uh, little bit less shine to it in the satin range, which I use. So uh, Jim, if you're going to be applying that by hand, I would certainly get, uh, uh, get a Nylox, a pretty Nylox brush, super fine bristles at the end. Get yourself some advance uh, satin, and then uh, you know, tell me how it works. I don't, I don't extend it, I don't cut that stuff, I don't dilute it, anything. It's just perfect right out of the can every time. Um, you know, I still use a respirator with it when I spray. Sometimes when I brush, it still has a little bit of smell, but my God, it's so much better. Uh, than the oil primers and the, and the oil enamels that I use. So, Jim, I hope that helps out, and uh, thanks for being a loyal uh, watcher here. Uh, I have a very interesting question. Uh, I saw Joyce uh, Husseini uh, pop on the live stream here. I have a question that uh, I've been doing a little research on over the last couple of weeks here. Uh, it has to do with interior paint and uh, product recalls, uh, manufacturer defects. So, Joyce writes, I have an interior paint issue that I'm not sure how to handle. Uh, so that it doesn't happen again. My three main living spaces are fairly open and are painted the same color. One room is drywall, the other two rooms are plaster. Uh, the paint has developed a chalky appearance that can't be washed off, but it, uh, that can be washed off, but it reappears again in a few weeks. All surfaces had been primed before painting. The wall paint is eggshell latex from Glidden, and then she writes, I know, I won't th make that mistake again. Uh, at one point, when I went back a few years to buy another gallon uh, to repaint a wall uh, that takes a beating, I stopped from buying. I was stopped from buying it at the checkout because they claimed that the paint had been recalled for a manufacturer's defect. I don't know what it is that led to the chalky appearance, or if there's some other problem. Several walls have been repainted with the product they released after the recall, and the chalking is back. Uh, I'm ready to change the color, but I want to make sure that I uh, don't have to do the only have to do the work once since I'm dealing with a large area, 13 windows, set of French doors, and I prefer darker colors so the chalky effect will be very obvious. How can I prep this so the chalking does not come back? In spite of it being very old, it is well insulated and the wall materials are less than 20 years old. 
I'll try to add a photo before Friday. And I've sent uh, photos and uh, there was a post uh, with two pictures uh, slightly before this in the Ask a Painter page uh, from with pictures from Joyce actually showing the chalking on the walls. And it was a lot of chalking. Um, I have not uh, seen this particular problem, but I, I don't think this is a coincidence that they had recalled the paint and then you, you dealt with this, especially something that migrates to the finish. Now, I should preface all this with saying anytime somebody says something went wrong with the paint, I will almost always call BS on them, um, especially in the paint trade. If you think about the manufacturer getting the paint to the store, mixing it at the store, getting it from the store to the job site, and then somebody putting it on, there is a million opportunities for human error in the painting process. And I will, I will claim that almost every problem in painting is due to human error, either choosing the, the wrong product, uh, using the wrong product in the wrong area, not, up, uh, not following the technical data sheets, which I'm a huge fan of. In this case, um, I, think, uh, I think because of the pervasiveness of this, and because this isn't a common problem, this, this doesn't have to do with the brush or the roller. Uh, it might have to do with the walls underneath, but if she's never had chalking before uh, and then ran into this, I would say that this is probably a, a one of the few true examples of manufactured defects in paint. Now, in my 23 years of uh, painting, I have only been witness to one manufacturer recall of paint. Uh, I won't name the manufacturer years ago because they handled it very well, but um, I was getting tiny, tiny, um, uniform size chunks of something. And they weren't just specks of dust, they weren't roller lint, they weren't something, they were just perfect little cylinders, almost like tiny little bits of wire cut into little things, almost like noodles, but just tiny, tiny noodles. Um, and it was uniform, and I dealt with this over about 15 gallons of paint in the middle of one winter. And uh, it actually ended up being a manufacturer defect from the facility. I was one of the first ones that sort of alerted them to it. They used my case to sort of track down some other stuff. They remediated me for it. I took care of my homeowners and it was handled very well. But I went through everything I had. I repainted the homeowners uh, thing at my cost with all new equipment, new brushes, new rollers. I even took my drop clogs and cleaned them just in case there was something coming off them because when I went to this manufacturer and asked them for money, I wanted to make sure that I did the scientific process and eliminated all doubt that it was me. I documented with photos and videos the process of it, um, you know, not only because I'm uh, litigious, um, because you'll never make your money back from something like this, but because I really wanted to know what the problem was and use it as a learning experience for myself in the future. Um, Having said that, uh, now that there's nothing you can do, Joyce, if you can go to Glidden and get some remediation, that would be wonderful. They will never make you whole again, no matter how nice they are. Uh, what I would do is wash down the walls uh, and, you know, again, don't use something that will leave a trace behind. You can use TSP to wash the walls, but then you have to wash it down with water again. So I would just use uh, water, a rag, something like that, uh, get all the chalk off and use a uh, work light, shine it from the side and just make sure you get all the uh, chalk off the walls. I would wait a week or two and then see if anything comes back. If nothing comes back, I think you would be safe to prime the walls and then uh, paint those uh, walls again. But I would do this. If somebody called me to do that, they would expect it to never show up and also look perfect. So I would end up using an odorless oil primer on it. I would probably do a test patch beforehand. I would come in and paint a small section of a, of a washed wall and then give it a week or two. And if nothing came back, I would proceed with top coat. Uh, but uh, oil primer would be my go-to. Uh, there are some good odorless primers. I've used some on, uh, on my basement floor actually as a problem solver. And uh, it was very good. The smell wasn't bad and it, uh, it, it felt just like traditional oil primer. That would save you from all the fumes in the house. Now, if you're if you're if you don't care about that and you want to remove all doubt, uh, just a straight you know Zinsser cover stain. Benjamin Moore makes uh, makes some good oil primers. Sherwin Williams makes some good oil primers. Track down some of those. Coat your walls with oil primer and then proceed uh, with your top coats. Now, you should be good after that. If it keeps coming back through that, you have a magical mystery uh, substance that can migrate through two or three coats of paint through oil primer and then more paint again. And I would imagine, uh, I would imagine that if you do the, uh, um, 
the priming process, you will probably not have this again. But Joyce, let us know what you do. Uh, if you're worried about committing to the whole area, certainly do a test patch. Do some portion of the wall that's easy to get to, that has some chalking problems. Maybe prep an area, maybe don't prep an area, and then prime both and then see what, uh, see what happens after that. But certainly let us know what happens. Or if you have solved this already, uh, let me know. I'm, I'd be very interested to see what either Glidden has to say about this or what uh, you, you did to solve the problem. Okay, so I'm gonna scroll through here and see what everybody has to say today. Well, Joyce, first one on the list there. I'm glad you could, glad you, if you have any other questions, Joyce, too, or if uh, you've been experimenting with this, let me know. Scott Road, uh, thanks for chiming in. Chad Wieskus, another member of the Mug Club, thanks for watching. Rob, good to see you, sir. Rick, good to see you, thanks for, uh, thanks for coming on here. Roger, as well, another pro painter. Um, yeah, thank you guys so much for watching. Roger, don't rub too hard on the wool carpet. Yeah, if you're lucky enough to work in places with wool carpets, yeah, I would, uh, I would, uh, I would be very careful with that, and I would plan on replacing that for them, <laughs> probably at a, at a very large expense. Uh, Rob, when are you going to try breakthrough? I actually completed uh, my project with the breakthrough yesterday. Um, I've been trying to think of a way uh, to, to sort of you know, think about breakthrough as a breakthrough uh, for homeowners and for pros is a product from PPG and it's sort of like a trim enamel, uh, a very fast drying paint, but a very hard paint. It's made for, you know, the typical project that you would do this. Let's say you have to repaint an apartment complex inside all the door frames or a hotel, you're doing a redecoration and you have hundreds and hundreds of door frames to do. This is a super hard paint. It's all water-based, but it's fast dry, touches up fairly easily, brushes out. You know, it, it's supposed to be the best of both worlds. Doesn't smell bad, easy to work with, but yet dries hard like an oil enamel or a hybrid enamel. Um, it sprays. I was told that it's a very thin product to build it over coats and do this and that. My experience with it yesterday was uh, I used a very small tip, uh, an actual uh, switch tip, uh, which is one of my favorites. It's, uh, it's from Titan where it's got a thin pattern and then a wide pattern. I do that to keep overspray down in a house and then to conserve paint as well. You know, you don't want to be wasteful. I've been trying to think of where, where, where in my world uh, you know, this paint fits in and how do I explain it? Uh, it went on very, very thick. Uh, <laughs> for, for as much here tell as I had about it being thin and not covering very well or you know, vice versa, um, it went on very thick and I has, actually had to be very, very diligent with how I sprayed. Now I was doing a staircase, uh, a kinked two level staircase with some other sections of railings and stuff and it actually kinked down so that they crossed and I had to be very careful in that crossover section about spraying. I had to be very diligent with it because if you went over something twice, you got a huge sag. If you went over something once, dried perfect, beautiful finish. It did dry very quickly. Uh, that was good. Uh, I will be going back later today or Monday uh, to test the hardness of it on a sample that I did. Um, but you know, it's a, it's got a great finish, uh, the satin finish. I can't speak to the hardness yet because I haven't tested it out with my test yet. Uh, but no, it, uh, it, it dried very quickly. I was pleased with that. Uh, the only downside is that most of the overspray acted almost like a dry fall in the air. Uh, it, would, it would fall and, uh, and it would be dry already in little pebbles. Now that's good if you're, if you're working linearly from left to right or from top to bottom and moving from one area to the house to the other. But because I was in a central staircase moving around again, you know, uh, even with covering some lower sections, you would spray a little at the top and there'd be dry little beads of stuff on the lower staircase already. And uh, you know, even if you covered it and took it off, you'd still have to be weary of that sort of stuff. So in some cases, it might even dry a little too quick, uh, at least uh, as far as that goes. But you know, I'm very pleased with the product so far. Um, I think uh, you know, out, of, uh, the, out of my two, uh, out of my two uh, criteria for testing a product like that, you know, how does it, I, I really don't care about cost. Cost is not a big deal. Uh, you know, when you're dealing with projects like this, it's all labor, especially when you're doing a staircase. You know, we could spend 70 hours prepping a staircase and two hours painting it. So really to me, the paint, the price isn't an issue. It's how is it to go on? How nice is the finish? And then the second part of that is how hard is it? Does it actually give you an enamel? Because if we wanted something that went on quick, dried fast, and you know, whatever, you just use a wall paint, but wall paints aren't hard enough to stand up to a stairwell and handrails and things like that. So I cannot tell you, 
Uh, the other part of that, uh, until I actually go back and do my testing, and I'm going to be very fair, uh, I will test it soon and see how hard it is, and then I will give it a couple of weeks, and I'll test my sample as well to see if, uh, if anything has changed over the last little bit. So, uh, Rob, I will, uh, I will give you a little more uh, feedback on that when I get it, but uh, otherwise, I'm actually fairly pleased with it. I think it has a very interesting place in our, uh, in our uh, you know, in our markets, and, uh, you know, especially if you're doing industrial or commercial applications, I think that's where that product is supremely fitted uh, for that sort of thing. So um, I'm not brand specific. I use a little bit of everything. I mean, most of my supplies come from Ace Hardware, Sherwin-Williams, this and that, and now PPG. There's a store not far from me, and I think I'm going to add that uh, to my arsenal for, for things like that. So James Gilbert, good to see you, my friend. All right, Kim. <laughs> Old college friend of mine, Kim, thanks for watching. Danielle, awesome, uh, thanks. No, no problem. And uh, Danielle, again, let us know what you do to solve the problem of the carpet uh, or if you just scrap it all together and start over. I'm always curious. Juanita, good to see you. Chiming in. Uh, Rob, love Advance. Yeah, Advance is just a great, um, you know, I like the Sherwin-Williams product too, um, but they, they feel different. You know, uh, one is thicker, one is thinner. Uh, I feel that one maybe sands a little better um, for for at least the enamels. Enamel is such a huge thing. I mean, this kitchen right here uh, is a fresh enamel job. And for many reasons, especially this, when you have 90% of a job wrapped up in labor, a product like Advance is just an amazing feat uh, of what you can get done in a certain amount of time and still give your homeowner the finest finish you can get. Because I could do lacquer. I am a firm non-believer of lacquer for the molecular structure of lacquer allows water to migrate through, uh, you know, things like that. It's, it's not very conducive uh, at its basic level to water. This stuff is as close to the traditional oil as I can get. And I have some pieces of furniture and cabinets and this and that that have, you know, probably somewhere between a 70 and 90 year old oil finish on it. And yeah, they show wear and tear. but. It's amazing how well they they hold up, and I, I don't feel I can say the same for a lacquered piece of furniture 90 years from now. I feel that it'll basically be worn down to the bare wood, it'll have water rings, all sorts of odd stuff going on. So my belief personally, I understand uh, lacquer has a place in the industry, but in my place, I get these jobs because I offer my people a pain in the ass finish to work with. This does not make my life easier, but I can offer them the finest finish, and if I agree to a certain terms of the product and, and understandings from the technical data sheets, I can turn out stuff like this, and I can also sleep at night knowing that uh, these cabinets are probably going to wear out before this paint does. Uh, Scott Rowe, do you have any experience with Sherwin-Williams Pro Classic uh, water base for trim? I do. Um, you know, back in the days of water-based Impervo and then uh, Pro Classics, uh, water-based, great stuff. I, it, uh, the Pro Classics covers very well. So if you have beat up, dirty trim, stuff like that, or you have a bunch of bare wood and you're going to a, a different color, it's a great product for that. Uh, it does not sand well for my liking. Uh, and it looks and it feels kind of like a rubbery sort of, you know, water-based acrylic coating, which is fine. I understand its place. Uh, but to me, if you're going to spend all the time to enamel all the trim in a new house or cabinets like that, it's not hard enough for me. And I wouldn't use it in my own house for that reason. But again, like I said, uh, Pro Classics is a proven, proven uh, formula. Now, I, the same thing goes for water-based and Pervo. If you have to use water-based on trim, excuse me. <coughs> if you have to use water-based finish on trim, you cannot do better than Impervo and Pro Classic. Uh, I like all of the satin, the lower shines of it, because the glossier uh, you get, the cheaper those water-based finishes look, and they kind of get gummy and uh, stuff like that. So <coughs> if you have to use water-based, those two are awesome, awesome finishes. And I may even throw Breakthrough in there, uh, depending on how well that performs, you know, with the scratch tests and things like that. So, And Scott, if you have any, uh, uh, you know, personal experience with that stuff or some uh, tips for us, certainly let us know. Uh, Joyce, thanks. I'll tackle this in the spring when I can open the windows and certainly do. Uh, this is a, a ongoing show. So uh, when you tackle this, let me know. All right. Rob, wait till you see how tough it is. I'm gonna have to take your word on it. I, I, I think you actually put some money up. 
uh, as to proving uh, to me that it's uh, it's nice and hard. So I will I will certainly take you up on that, Kristen. Good to see you chiming in here, Scott. Have you ever heard anything about the Graco GX19 Finish Pro? We picked one up for smaller jobs where we didn't want to get the 395 Finish Pro. We like it so far. If uh, if memory recalls, again, um, I am not a tech guy. I'm not a gear guy. I uh, When it comes to buying a piece of equipment, I do an insane amount of research. I make my decision, and then I put that sucker on the ground, and I use it, and I want it to work forever with you know whatever maintenance I have to do. So I'm not I'm not up to all the stuff. If memory serves me, the GX19 is a very small unit, low pressure unit with a tiny hopper on it. And Scott, you'll have to tell me if that's uh, true or not, because uh, I don't know the model name. But when I was looking for a new um, fine finish uh, machine, that one came up a lot. And then the 395 Air Assisted Airless. Now I ended up going with the Air Assisted Airless only because in theory, uh, you know. It seemed like a more industrial piece of equipment. It seemed bigger. It seemed better. It just seemed like something that I would probably uh, hand down to my great grandchildren at the end of this. Also, it made the uh, the the promise of doing a finer finish. It had a whole bunch of other benefits. A more refined machine. You know, Ferrari versus Ford. That was sort of the comparison uh, that I make it in my mind. And so far, I think this is my fourth or fifth kitchen. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful machine to work with. When that sucker turns on, it's just beautiful. Having said that, uh, it's very expensive. The GX19 is much, much less expensive, and uh, a very, very skilled craftsman can take a Titan 440, uh, Graco 390, 395, uh, and also a GX19 and do a very, very similar finish to this uh, with those machines. Now, uh, people compliment my finishes all the time here. I use my air-assisted airless on them, but remember, I do not spray oil primer with my air assisted airless. I want to keep that a dedicated machine to my uh, uh, trim enamel. I use a 23 year old Graco. <laughs> uh, I think it's a 390 or a 395 STS. Uh, it has been painting as long as I have and I spray my oil primer on here. So everything you see has the foundation of a 23 year old uh, paint sprayer that I do minimal maintenance on that I got used that has given me, you know, 10 years of, of flawless performance. So keep in mind, experience can make up for a lot of this fancy uh, stuff here. But if you have the experience and you want to push it farther, I think that's where a lot of these new machines come in. Or like with the GX19, if I'm thinking about the right one, less expensive machines, smaller machines, you can have them dedicated to different things. One just for oil clears, one just for water clears, one just for hybrid enamel, one just for you know, uh, oils, one's just for what, you know, you can do that. Now, when you have a 395 air assisted airless, you know, you can't have a whole bunch of those machines lying around one for this one for that. You'll have to clean it out or get new hoses and stuff like that. So Scott, let me know if that helps out here. And I would love to know your experience with a GX 19. Cause I was, I was very close to purchasing one myself. Roger, please look into Devolve, uh, HP dev flex for waterborne trim coatings. Um, when I, I will certainly take you up on that. And uh, Sticks is actually another uh, primer product that I will be checking into shortly here because so many people uh, do that. Now, I have little to no availability of Devolve. So if I need Devolve, it will take a lot of time and a lot of effort for me to get it. So I appreciate the recommendation. Uh, when I try to do my stuff, I try to keep it to the big three or four so that within an hour of basically where everybody lives, unless you're in North Dakota somewhere, you'll be able to get this stuff. So Roger, I will certainly, uh, I will certainly get a hold of some of that stuff and try it. I'm always curious about uh, uh, products, new stuff, but uh, you know, I try to keep it Sherwin Williams, Benjamin Moore, Ace Hardware, uh, Valspar, things that are sort of readily available so that when I make a recommendation, you know, somebody can, somebody can get that stuff. But no, thank you for your suggestion. I do appreciate that. Scott, yeah, that's one with the small hopper. Okay, so good. I was thinking about the right one. It's a very tempting machine, and you know, um, the benefit is, you know, when you're in a kitchen like this. I mean, imagine this this hood portion over here. If you're using a Titan 440 or a Graco 390, 395, and you're going, you know, 1700 psi, you are spraying a ton of paint in a small little area. And if you hit one of those areas with one too many passes, you're going to get a huge sag in it like that. Uh, with the air assisted airless and uh, I think hopefully with the GX19 you can go to lower pressure so you can actually take your time a little bit and maybe if one area has a little holiday you can go back over again without the fear of just a ton of paint sagging 
on there and having you know tons of anybody who's got a big sag in a door or an odd piece of trim you understand how long it takes to fix that and then recode it so um, very very good thing to do here Rob you will not be able to scratch breakthrough uh, my PPG dealer has a door that it, that he insists you try and scratch the paint off the wood will dent but the paint is like armor I hope so I hope so because this is on a stairwell that's gonna get heavy use so PPG is their parent. Oh, for DeVoe. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll check with my PPG dealer and see what we can do for DeVoe here. It's not, uh, DeVoe is not something that I've ever seen on a job site or, uh, or, or regular there. And uh, Rob as well, uh, Benjamin Moore has sticks. Now, I have not seen it in any of my Benjamin Moore retailers. Could be a regional product. I bet not, but uh, it's probably somewhere in my area. I will track that stuff down. So, uh, let me check my notes here, see if I forgot anything. Well, that's it, guys. I do appreciate it. I appreciate everybody watching. I appreciate all the questions. Uh, the reason I started this show uh, was for the live back and forth. Uh, I enjoy I enjoy doing uh, topics. I enjoy doing uh, you know questions that are sent in beforehand. But the reason I did this uh, was for the live question and answer. So thank you guys for all the questions during the feed here. Oh, Keith. <laughs> Uh, Keith's an awesome uh, local fellow. He's a fireman, uh, works at one of the car dealers. Thanks for watching, Keith. Appreciate that. Um, thank you all for watching this. If you have questions for me, go to the Ask a Painter Facebook page and start a new thread or a new comment for those. Attach some pictures, describe your process. If something's gone wrong, describe what went wrong. If you want to do something to something, describe what you want it to look like, and I can help you along that way. Uh, Instagram, Slavic Nick. Facebook, I have uh, the three pages. I have the Ask a Painter. I have my professional page, uh, the Nick Slavic Painting and Restoration page, and the um, and uh, just my personal page. And I've been slowly experimenting with separating those out. So follow along if you like. Uh, there's a follow button here if you want to get uh, instant updates when I go live every Friday. You can do that too. And uh, thanks again for all the questions, guys, and uh, have a good weekend.